And so now we move forward. The clock ticks. Michael Rosbosch is the Peter Gruber Professor of Neuroscience at Brandeis University, an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. He's a geneticist, molecular biologist, and a chronobiologist. He received his doctoral degree in 1970 at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge under Sheldon Penman. Subsequently, he spent three years on a postdoctoral fellowship in genetics at the University of Edinburgh. Since 1974, he's been on the faculty at Brandeis University at Waltham, where he's collaborated, as you heard, with Jeffrey Hall and investigated the genetic influences on circadian rhythms of the internal biological clock. Michael Rosbosch is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. In more recent years, he has been working on the brain neuronal aspects of circadian rhythms. I would like to ask you all to join me in welcoming Professor Rosbash to the stage where he will deliver his 2017 Nobel Prize lecture entitled, The Circadian Clock, Transcript Transcriptional Feedback and the Regulation of Gene Expression. Welcome. So it's a great pleasure to be here, a great honor. Uh, I, this, this whole business since the 2nd of October at 5.10 in the morning Boston time has left me virtually speechless. But being speechless is not really appropriate here, is it? So I'm afraid I'm going to have to screw up my courage and try and say something. So uh, let, let me uh, begin by trying to give you a little introduction to uh, circadian rhythms. And first, <clears throat> as I like to do, uh, to not forget this, I want to thank my current lab uh, for the work they're currently doing, which I'll try and allude to at the end if I have a moment. Uh, pay attention to the time here. Uh, and especially Kate Abruzzi, who's been with me for 16 years and has made the trip here to Stockholm to celebrate with all of us. And so circadian rhythms uh, is a, a, a biochemical, as, as the slide says, physiological and behavioral adaptation to the rotation of the earth. And there are two purposes to this. One is anticipation, namely the early bird gets the worm and the early worm avoids being eaten by the bird. And secondly, the clock manages to, uh, to create internal coherence so that different reactions, different steps in metabolism, for example, happen in order and not all simultaneously. Uh, oxidative and reduction reactions are happiest when they're separated uh, in time. And so <clears throat> circadian rhythms arose a long time ago in response, of course, to this rotation of the Earth. And the rotation of the Earth was occurring well before nutrition anything was anything like what's currently available on our planet, and well before the atmosphere had its current gaseous constitution. And in fact, uh, the oldest clock we know, the clock in cyanobacteria, really participated in oxygenation of the atmosphere. So two billion years ago, we lived in a, we lived, the planet uh, experienced a, a reducing atmosphere and it was really cyanobacteria with the aid of its clock that produced the oxygen that uh, enabled life as we currently know it to arise. And so clocks exist really in different kingdoms, not only in bacteria, as I just alluded to, 
but also in plants and in animals, which I will focus on. And it's likely uh, that these clocks arose independently because there's very little evidence of a relationship, especially between the cyanobacterial clock and animal clocks, and probably even the plant clocks arose independently. So this is such a powerful, uh, such a powerful contribution to fitness that it arose in these independent lines. And so a, a, a simple systems view of circadian clocks, uh, a so-called skinogram named after Arnold Eskin, one of the early pioneers in the field, is illustrated here. And, and it, it simply uh, demonstrates the fact that there are input signals, principally light, also temperature, which entrain the clock. The clock does not run exactly at 24 hours. Our endogenous period in humans, for example, is about 12 to 15 minutes long. And it's light every day, which resets our clock back to 24 hours. Those are the input signals. And then there are outputs, all kinds of things that we measure, we commonly measure, so-called the hands of the clock, which of course are not the clock itself, the clock are the gears inside and the hands simply respond at various points to the, to the clock itself. And, and it's really the, uh, the nature of the pacemaker, the nature of the timekeeper, which is the focus of this lecture, in fact, the focus of this prize. And as, as, as Jeff alluded to, um, the, the beginning of this problem, certainly the beginning for us, not the beginning of all circadian work, but the modern beginning is really due to Konopka and Benzer, shown here uh, on the bottom right, not at the beginning when Ron was a student in his lab, but much later in an interview. And, and these two people, and it was really Konopka who brought the circadian problem to Seymour. Uh, Konopka was interested as an undergraduate in circadian rhythms, and he suggested, as Jeff indicated, why don't we apply this genetic expertise to this biological problem in Drosophila. And they isolated three alleles of this gene they named period. And, and those three alleles uh, either eliminated rhythms altogether, they gave, there was a short period variant and a long period variant. The so-called per zero allele, per S for short, and per L for long. And remarkably, these alleles, these variants, had exactly the same effect on two completely different rhythmic phenomena, namely emergence of the adult from the pupil case, shown on your left, or locomotor activity rhythms, the running around of the fruit fly, the fruit fly's activity rest cycle. Now we know their sleep-wake cycle, <coughs> which, were, which were either absent, short, or long, exactly um, as, as one might have anticipated from the, uh, from the, eclosion, from the eclosion rhythms. So this was a, 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 a magnificent contribution. And for those of you who chase high-profile papers, and perhaps this is a different angle on Jeff's Ed Lewis story, uh, in the first decade after this paper was published, it had 10 citations. So, so uh, you, 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 uh, uh, the, 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 the high-profile papers are not necessarily the ones which have staying power. And so uh, in, at, at Brandeis, uh, Jeff and my lab got together, and independently, Mike Young's lab at Rockefeller, uh, to clone this gene in, in the early days of recombinant DNA. And this is a, a picture of the group uh, that, that uh, did this, uh, Will Zaring, Tony James, uh, the guy in the middle, is, uh, Jeff Hall, uh, Pranita Reddy, that's me, believe it or not, uh, and, and uh, Dave Wheeler. And so uh, it was that group and, and in fact, a, 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 an additional group of people uh, in my lab, uh, who I'm going to focus on, there were also people in Jeff's lab, but I want to uh, 
sort of make sure that I acknowledge the people in my lab who contributed to this. Pranit, I already mentioned, Chang Yu, Shin Lo, and Yoav Sitri, uh, who unfortunately passed away. And, and that group really contributed to cloning and sequencing the period gene in my lab uh, in the early uh, mid-80s. Mid and the, uh, the outcome was that this was a, a pioneer protein. That meant this was such early days that the sequence identified no relatives in the database. The, se the number of sequence proteins was so small that the chance of hitting upon a relative, uh, a gene with a similar sequence, which might give you a clue uh, as to what the protein was doing, just didn't exist. And so we spent several years uh, struggling to try to uh, ex uh, find the promised land from the desert. Um, and, and one clue for us was a paper that Chang Yu produced in 1987 uh, that, that suggested that an intriguing repeat region within the protein, which turns out to be not very interesting anymore, um, was not necessary for circadian function. In other words, we could take the DNA that encoded the period protein, transform it into an arrhythmic animal, and we got perfectly good circadian function, which was missing uh, this particular region. So that suggested that we needed to look in a, in a different uh, direction. And as science often has it, it turned out that the literature uh, started to provide a bit of a clue for a direction to look at. And this paper was produced shortly after Chang's paper from Steve Cruz and Corey Goodman. And they cloned a Drosophila gene called single-minded. And it was a nuclear protein. They actually didn't know at the time it was a transcription factor, just a nuclear protein. And, and it had homology to the period protein. In fact, we were now no longer the pioneer um, single-minded was the new protein, and they, they, were, they benefited from having us there, although, of course, since we didn't know what our protein did, it was, it was a limited utility except providing uh, a, a high-profile connection for their paper. And so, nonetheless, the nuclear localization of single-minded suggested to us that gene expression in some way might be relevant uh, to the function of the period protein. And uh, shortly thereafter, Paul Harden, who was a postdoc in my lab, really produced what is arguably uh, the, the most important paper from my lab, uh, that uh, the period gene product, the protein, was involved in a feedback loop which affected, which regulated the oscillations uh, of its own mRNA. And, and this is a, a quantitation of those uh, data and, and the key thing, there are two key features of this. One is that the messenger RNA profile goes like this in time, and there are 24 hours between peaks. Uh, but if that experiment is done in a per short background in which the period protein has a one amino acid difference from the wild type protein, then the distance between those peaks is 19 or 20 hours rather than 24 hours. Uh, exactly mimicking the behavior. And so we proposed that, that this must be really important, perhaps central to timekeeping, um, but a, as I'll try and, and explain in just a couple of minutes, um, it was still a little bit of work to come up with a, a, a more, a tighter, more, more uh, restricted model. And this is a present that Paul gave me uh, less than a month ago at a party we had, and this is the original gel showing oscillations um, and, and, and the original paper under glass it refers to, you know, it was, it was a, a present uh, that was framed. Um, and so, so uh, I, I, I cherish uh, this gift. Thank you, Paul. And, and this was really not easy to do for two reasons. One is uh, when you use whole flies, there were no oscillations that were visible. You had to use heads. That was his uh, brainchild uh, because in the body there's lots of tissues which don't undergo oscillation and that damped the signal so it really wasn't visible. It's often in science a very small change uh, 
which makes all the difference. And, and, um, and secondly, this is before PCR. So these, these assays were done by RNAs protection, and that itself is a little bit of a story, which I'll come to. So this particular gel gave rise to a model, and, and I call it a cautious model. This is the actual picture from the paper, the last figure of the paper. And, and what uh, I want you to appreciate was that there was no mention of transcription in the title or the abstract, in other words, feedback loop. Uh, it was, there was feedback loop, but no m mention of transcription. And the way we uh, imagined this was that it could work at the post-transcriptional level. For example, maybe messenger RNA half-life was uh, affected, uh, was regulated, and not transcription. It could be transcription. And, and moreover, it could be indirect. In other words, the period protein could affect these things directly, but perhaps the period protein affects another protein, which is actually the direct regulator, or, or most uh, indirect, if you will, is that the period protein could influence behavior, which could, in fact, feed back and affect the uh, molecular oscillations. In other words, behavior would actually be upstream as opposed to downstream of the molecular oscillations. So we were very conservative about this. And, and it turned out that over the next two or three years, um, that there were three pap four papers that uh, my lab produced, the first of which was really also Paul's work, which cemented the feedback loop model and emphasized transcription. So this first paper in PNAS, and, and um, uh, an, interesting, an interesting aside is we really had trouble publishing this paper because everyone assumed this was transcription. And I, I, my lab worked on post-transcriptional regulation in yeast half of my lab, and so I was well aware that this was not a slam dunk. This was not for sure to be transcriptional. And, and what this paper showed was the fact that the pre-messenger RNA, the intron-containing RNA, also underwent circadian oscillations, essentially indistinguishably from the messenger RNA, and also you could take the upstream region, the promoter region of the gene, and you could put it in front of a reporter gene in this case, choline acetyltransferase, CAT, and, and, uh, and, and that regulatory, damn it, that regulatory DNA would, would, uh, would oscillate, uh, that, that, that reporter RNA would oscillate in exactly the same way as the per RNA. So all you needed was the upstream DNA really indicating that this was very likely to be transcription. So, the model strongly favored transcription. And then over the next couple of years, uh, three more papers really cemented this model. One, our only collaboration with the aforementioned Seymour Benzer, in which uh, immunoelectron microscopy was done to show that the period protein was really nuclear. Um, <clears throat> if we constitutively overexpressed the protein, uh, this work done by Hong Zheng, Hong Kui Zheng, who is an eminent neuroscientist today, the scientific director of the Allen Institute, um, then, then this would clamp period mRNA levels uh, very low and, and non-oscillating, consistent with a repressor function. And, and, and lastly, um, the, the region of homology between single-minded and period, and then a third protein, then so-called named the past domain, turned out to be a dimerization domain, um, which could account for the how period would work as a repressor, namely by associating with a positive transcription factor, which contained uh, a past domain. And this, this study was led by Josh Wong, who is uh, and, and also an eminent neuroscientist at Cold Spring Harbor today. So uh, that really led us to uh, the, the negative feedback loop model at the level of transcription, and I should say at this time, uh, or shortly before this time, I won a bet from Mike Young, a dinner for the four of us, their wives, that gene expression would be the uh, focus of the function of the protein, and he paid his debt, and we had a lovely dinner. Uh, <clears throat> and so, uh, it, it, mammals, 
entered the story at this time when Sho Takahashi and his colleagues uh, initiated and carried out a really heroic genetic screen in mice, in some ways encompassing the original Konopka and Benzer work, plus the cloning the and, the re and the rescuing and the sequencing of the protein, um, and came up with a, a mutant which affected circadian rhythms very dramatically. Uh, fortunately for them, uh, the 25th mouse, which was several standard deviations off the norm for the period that they would normally see. Here's the wild type phenotype, and here's the, that particular mutant mouse. And, and of course, they named, they named that mouse, they named that gene clock, and it turned out to be a pass containing transcription factor, which um, plays a role uh, in this story. And uh, <clears throat> at the same time, in my lab, Ravi Alada, who's here, and Joan Rudela were involved in a, in a lengthy genetic screen to try to find uh, other circadian mutants. And, and we, we knew about the, the remarkable work in the Young Lab, and we didn't want to duplicate what they were doing, looking for period-altered mutations. So we actually looked at arrhythmic mutations, and, and it turns out that arrhythmic mutations are very easy to find. We had more than 40 of them, but they're very hard to sort out, to distinguish interesting ones from uninteresting ones. And so we devised a subscreen, and the subscreen for these mutants was to look at which of the strains had non-cycling in very low period and timeless levels. The idea being that if we had hit upon the positive transcription factor we were looking for, the X in our, in our diagram, then, then there should be no cycling and, and low levels. And in fact, we only found three, uh, three mutant strains which met that criterion, and two of those turned out to be alleles of cycle or BMAL, the ortholog in mammals, and one of them turned out to be uh, an allele of clock. So in fact, we, we had um, closed the circle, if you like, and, and uh, managed to identify the positive transcription factor, the heterodimer that drives period and timeless, which then represses clock and cycle, and it turns out three of the same four proteins uh, function in the same way in the same way in, in mammals. And so this is uh, really conserved in the 550 million years or so of evolution since uh, flies and mammals diverged, clearly present in the common ancestor that lived long ago. And um, of course, I'm, I'm focusing on transcriptional regulation, uh, but there's a whole world of post-transcriptional regulation that uh, Mike, Mike will uh, allude to for example, the function of timeless and double time genes that were uh, isolated um, in his lab. So uh, this is now a common theme, as uh, you've already heard, uh, among circadian oscillators, uh, neurospora, plants, uh, mice, where an activator leads, gives rise to the synthesis of a repressor, which then increases in concentration and then that repressor feeds back in the nucleus, interacts with the activator, turns off synthesis of the repressor, uh, the proteins, the messenger RNAs and proteins decay away, and, and the whole uh, st system starts again then. So I, I just mentioned very briefly something contemporary uh, just uh, to show that this particular uh, aspect of investigation is not over. Um, this is a ChIP-seq profile uh, for the uh, active scientists who might be interested in the audience. Uh, this is a, a six time, time, uh, a time course uh, from the morning and then throughout the day to the evening. And this is the association of timeless or period with the uh, uh, upstream region of the DNA. Uh, with these so-called e-boxes. This is when the repressors associate. And, and the black arrows indicate the time at which clock, or the positive factor, associates with these same regions. And of course, not surprisingly, there's a delay between the association 
of the activator and the subsequent association of the repressors, so the repressors build up and then associate to the turn off transcription. And, and it turns out to be, to be quite interesting that the profile, if one does exactly the same kind of assay, but in this case actually tries to uh, identify the proteins by mass spectrometry that are associated with the clock site complex on chromatin, that there's a much more discrete um, association of period and timeless at the time of maximum repression. In other words, the, by chip seek, the proteins associate continuously, whereas by mass spec, uh, there's a much more uh, discrete feature of association. And so there's something uh, that's very different that happens at a very particular time on chromatin that's associated with this repression step. And this is only uh, to say a word about this uh, particular, kind of, uh, particular kind of assay. And so beyond the feedback loop, uh, I, I just will say a word about the fact that um, we and others, we and others have, have tried to address the notion of how much oscillation is there really. And in a paper that we published in 2001, we made two uh, findings. One is that there are a large number of cycling RNAs in fly heads, much beyond this very constrained small feedback loop. And, and secondly, that none of this oscillation, none of these cycling RNAs happen without a functional clock psych complex. So in other words, the small feedback loop really does sit at the top of a hierarchy, which gives rise to a large number uh, of oscillating transcripts. And of course, the current view, the way to put this together and create a cartoon to rationalize this, if you like, is the fact that this small feedback loop here, which governs timing, there are a few more, uh, a, a small or perhaps not so small number of direct target genes. Those direct target genes include other transcription factors, and those other transcription factors lead to um, the, the oscillation of secondary, uh, secondary target genes and, and output functions. And, and it's really this, um, this idea, coupled with the fact that there are, in, in mammals, uh, flies as well, there really are clocks in all tissues of the body, not only the brain, but liver, kidney, the adrenal gland, pancreas, skin, lung, heart, etc. And, and it's really the, the fact that clocks are present everywhere. I think Uli Schibler gets the lion's share of the credit for really pointing out, uh, do, doing a seminal experiment to indicate that this is the case. And the combination of the large number of cyclers indirectly produced from the feedback loop plus the, the many tissues in which this uh, occurs um, is the fact, gives rise to the fact that in the entire mammalian organism, more than 50% of all gene expression is under circadian control. So in other words, in excess of half of the 25,000 genes that we manufacture are governed by the circadian clock. And it's, of course, because of that feature that this picture uh, makes really some sense, the fact that all kinds of phenomena that we're interested in, including sleep, which you'll hear about from Mike Young, and metabolism, and all sorts of other things, are really uh, under, under the control um, of the circadian clock. So, uh, I'm, I'm going to just say, as it, it was present in the introduction, that my current interests are really uh, the, the, the 75 neurons which function in the fly brain and within which, um, these red neurons, within which the sur same circadian feedback loop occurs in sync. And, and the question that we're quite focused on is how do those neurons give rise to this very complicated uh, behavioral profile that's characteristic of Drosophila and many other insects, namely a morning peak of activity, a siesta in the middle of the day. As Jeff indicated, these fruit flies are very smart. Um, 
the, the uh, a peak of activity in the evening and, th and then sleep at night. And all that whole profile is really controlled by those 75 neurons. And, and uh, I've also become a, a, um, a pseudo uh, neuroscientist, and so we're quite interested in how to assay firing patterns of discrete neurons uh, in, in wake, in wake behaving flies. So flies that are running around and doing all kinds of behavior, how can you d really assay the firing patterns of, of flies under those non-constrained conditions and firing patterns of very discrete um, subsets of neurons. So um, I think, I, think um, I, I will turn in the last couple of minutes to a couple of uh, a couple of philosophical points and try to address this question, why, why am I receiving uh, this, this awesome prize and what did, what did I actually contribute? Uh, so that's, as, as, Jeff, as Jeff told you about, it's the AIs which really do the work and a, and a, and a PI who is ever so slightly introspective uh, asks himself this question from time to time and especially at times like this. So I, 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 I am persistent. Um, that's for sure. Um, that is a characteristic of mine. Um, I, 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 w I worked for many years uh, on yeast post-transcriptional regulation, and, and that yeast lab, of course, I didn't have two labs. I had one lab with two themes, and the people were all intermingled. And so knowing about nucleic acids uh, really helped our work, both experimentally as I alluded to from the, this, this uh, RNA's protection experiment of Paul Hardin's, and also my training. Um, the fact is that circadian rhythms had been dominated by neuroscience, and neuroscientists are interested in things that happen at the millisecond level, or even sub-millisecond. But this didn't make any sense for phenomena which operates on a 24-hour time scale, but the half-lives of RNA pro and proteins does make sense, and, and it was with that knowledge that some of, some of this work uh, was done. And, and then, of course, uh, I was smart enough to, to um, <clears throat> stay out of the way of talented people and, and, and let them make progress. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of luck and good fortune that goes into, uh, that goes into work, uh, that goes into life. Uh, my attache this week. Uh, if you can believe it, is named Purr. Um, so so I, 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 when he introduced himself, I said that I lead a charmed life. This could not possibly really happen to me. Um, that is the, the nickname of the gene, of course, that we worked on. Um, so m more, more, uh, m more substantively, so I came to Brandeis and I, and, I, and I encountered genetics. I was not a geneticist before I came to Brandeis and Jeff was one feature but only one of several people at Brandeis who were interested in genetics. Uh, recombinant DNA came around just at the right time for our career. This was a perfect storm. Um, I, I think for those of you who like movies and Jeff, Jeff um, introduced this, this metaphor uh, I, I could say that recombinant DNA was R. Ingrid Berg Bergman, and, and to quote from Casablanca, of all the gin joints and all the town, towns and all the world, she walked into ours. And, and you might not know, but the Epstein brothers who wrote the, the screenplay for Casablanca had two different endings, and on one of them, Rick Blaine gets in the plane to Lisbon along with Ingrid Bergman, and so we had the, we were in Stockholm. We, we, we had the happy ending um, to this story. And, and so uh, I also, the, the feedback loop was correct in general. That was not for sure. Tons of cycling RNAs. Uh, much most of animal physiology is under con our control. Who knew? Who, who, who knew that's how it would come out? Um, I, I, we were, I was fortunate to be funded by remarkable far-sighted organizations, HHMI, NIH. Um, my, my university is, is, is a wonderful meritocracy. Those, those funding agencies are meritocracies, and my environment uh, was great. 
Uh, I, I have already uh, mentioned the, the fact that we, it's really the AIs who do stuff. And of course, I had this long friendship and collaboration uh, with Jeff Hall. Uh, this allowed us to put our two labs together, as he mentioned. People in his lab, like Ralph Sinefsky, John Ewer, I got to associate with, uh, co-mentor, if you will, in the case of John. Um, Patrick Emery in my lab, who's not here, uh, collaborated with Ralph on, on the cloning of cryptochrome. So, uh, and, and then of course, uh, this, this had an element, a strong element of personal friendship. Um, we, we, had, uh, we have strong personality differences, Jeff and I, I should say. Um, and, and, but we embrace those differences. We, we, uh, I, I think it was, it was really uh, an asset to our work and certainly uh, enriched me personally. Ralph Greenspan likes, likes to say that uh, he, we made him think of Gilbert and Sul Sullivan, who are arguably the most productive uh, collaborating duo in music and absolutely drove each other completely crazy in the course of their collaboration. Uh, so here's a list of, of the people uh, I work with and I want to particularly mention uh, Ravi, Isaac, Patrick, Josh Wong, Shin, Pranitha. These are the early day people, Joan Rudula, Wei Ching, Chang, Hong Kui, and Larry Zweibel. They're, they're the people who contributed to the early days of this story. Um, I had a yeast lab, as I mentioned, and, and uh, those people have gone on, many of them, to fame and fortune, and they were uh, critical to my success. One of those yeast people... Um, became my wife, Nadja Abovich, and, and of course uh, there's Nadja and I with our two daughters, and so uh, as, as some friends of mine like to say, uh, not only would I not be standing here without them, but I would be dead. And, 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 and lastly, let me just say, and with family and Nadja as a segue, that, that science, my view of science, is a very romantic profession. Um, you, you don't know what you're going to discover. Every day is an adventure. And, and uh, it, it's, it's really uh, a, a great privilege, a joy, a, a romance, as I said. And I think I'll end on that note with a short poem, which is present in Ralph Greenspan's book, Fly Pushing, and it's written by his wife, Danny. And here's the poem, O genotype, O phenotype, this kiss had better last her. He's off to see his other love, Drosophila melanogaster. Thank you very much.